I'm just going to ask you some questions about your dad. I'm a dad too, so. Yeah, I know, because you're a girl and you're a boy. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Action! What is your dad like? He's funny. He's really funny. He's really funny. How is he funny? His dad jokes. You like his dad jokes? No. What are some funny things that your dad does? He claps really hard and, and mom doesn't like it. He claps really loud. Yeah, like this. Wow. Wow. What is your dad good at? Working. He's really good at fixing things and building things. He usually goes to a fast food place to get his breakfast. What do you normally eat? Uh, biscuits and waffles. It's a lot of carbs. Is there stuff that he's not very good at? Not very good at wrestling, yes. Three against one. Yeah. <laughs> he's not that good at hair. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, I thought you were about to Was that a song you were singing? Um, no. <laughs> oh. What's well, something he's done? You're like, Dad is not very good at that. Jokes. Jokes. <laughs> is your dad pretty strong, dude? Yeah, because he always goes to CrossFit every day. So he's a CrossFit dad. He's like, explode! To do he's that. Like, uh. Do an impersonation of your dad. I'm just going to rest my eyes. <laughs> is there anything that your dad has taught you? Nope. What is it? What does he teach you? Sight words. Sight words. I copy him to do what he does. And yeah, you copy him. I just do stuff to make myself learn from him. What's your favorite thing to do with your dad? Snuggle and talk with stuffed animals. Go fishing. Play wrestle with me. When you get on his back, he like yanks us off of him. How does your dad make you feel? Special? Happy. He makes me hungry from his delicious food. He makes sure we're safe. He makes me happy. Yeah, that's what he makes me feel like. Good job, bro. Oh, man, is that not so cute? I love it. Uh, well, happy Father's Day again. I, uh, My name is Lacey. I serve on the team here, and I am so excited um, that my daddy is with us today. Um, he's not a stranger to Rock Hills Church. I know you guys love him and always love when he's here sharing the truth of Jesus. And uh, just one thing that I love about my dad, um, the, the most important thing, I could tell you all sorts of fun and crazy things, but especially especially those who don't know him. Um, I want you to know that who he is when you see him on stage is who he is when he's at home, who, he's, who he is when he's at the grocery store. And uh, I am thankful for the consistency of who my dad has been since I was a little girl and to see him loving Jesus, reading his Bible, um, talking to neighbors about Jesus, being kind, being playful. And uh, what I also love about my dad is I had several friends that didn't have the type of dad that I did. And every one of my friends always saw my dad as their dad. So if you're one of those today, you just call him dad too. All right. Hey, Rock Hills, like we've never done it before. Can you give it up for Pastor Terry Yancey? Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be together here at Rock Hills. And uh, sis, thank you. You always make me cry uh, in the right kind of way. Uh, there were times when you were a kid, that, uh, but we won't talk about that. Uh, it really is great to be here. I wish I had some good dad jokes, but I tried one on Patrick, and he said, I don't get it. I said, that's because it's a dad joke, so we'll... We'll just leave leave that. And everybody joining us online, good to see you. Uh, military, thanks for doing what you do. We're so glad that you are part of this service today. Wow, with only two services on Sunday instead of three, like this place is packed. I'm so glad that you got up early enough to be at the first service. And now when you go to the restaurant later, you will beat all the Baptist dads to the white chicken meat at the buffet. Yeah, all right, all right. Hey, one other thing, uh, 157 years ago, today, was the moment 
that African Americans in Texas, they were the last ones to hear the reading of the order of emancipation signed by President Abraham Lincoln. And so happy Juneteenth, the day that slavery finally ended in the United States of America. Praise God. And it happens to fall today on Father's Day. It just rotates the 19th every year, different day of the week. But I just wanted to say happy Juneteenth. Texas has been celebrating it since the 80s, but just recently, of course, uh, the United States Congress made it a, a federal holiday. Today is Father's Day, and uh, uh, I want to just bring this, this idea to you. Let me, let me start with this statement that's probably on the screen. Thinking correctly about the character of God represents the most important thoughts we will ever entertain. Now hear that. Let me say it again. Thinking correctly about the character of God represents the most important thoughts we will ever entertain. If we think incorrectly about Him and believe that our incorrect thoughts are truth, we will respond to Him incorrectly and that will not help our lives. It will not benefit us or the kingdom of God. It won't benefit if you're a daddy. It won't benefit your wife and kids if you don't think correctly about God. Now, on this Father's Day, I, I know that uh, not all of you will share my experience, but, but I had a wonderful daddy. I did. I just had a, a wonderful dad. This morning, sweetheart, I didn't tell you this, but I, I, as I walked past a mirror, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, my belly looks like my dad's. <laughs> That's... Some of you really kind of acted like that was, it, it, never mind, it, it's hurtful, but I'll, I'll get over it. <laughs> my dad had flaws, but he gave my mom, myself, and my two brothers a godly example of faithfulness, love, humility, and strength under control. Just a few months before he died, he was still, before he had the diagnosis of terminal lung cancer, uh, he was still probably the strongest man that I knew, but he never used his strength to harm us. I am so thankful for the daddy I had. Now, this is important. God is not like my dad, but as my dad became more like Jesus, he became a better dad. And whatever your experience is as a dad, if you look back on the years, maybe your kids are grown and gone. Maybe there's some estrangement. It's not too late. Become more like Jesus and you'll become a better dad. Now, I understand why some people have a, a, a low view of God, the Father, because they had an abusive dad. They had an unkind dad. They had an undependable dad. They had an absent father. They project those same attributes onto God the Father that the Bible describes. Well, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did the same thing with their view of God. They depicted their Olympian gods as immoral, moody, cantankerous, immortal human beings. They called them gods, but they projected all of these behaviors onto them that they saw swirling in their lives and in their culture. Their gods, the Greeks and the Romans, were every bit as vengeful, lustful, self-centered, abusive, incestuous, dishonest, adulterous, promiscuous, egocentric, undependable, and deceitful as humans. Now, I don't know if that is an appealing image of God to you. But it is not an appealing image of God to me. And it's definitely not the image that the scriptures give to our heavenly Father, the God of the Bible. Now here's the truth, and it's a little different way to say what I said earlier about my dad. We can become more like the heavenly Father of the Bible, but he has never been like us in our sinfulness the psalmist said in Psalm 50, verse 21, when you did these things, the, the, like the list I read about the, uh, the Olympian gods, the deceitful and promiscuous and undependable, all of that, he says, he says, when you did these things and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. Wrong. 
God is not like us, but we, by the Spirit of Jesus, can become like Him. Now, I have great memories of my, my dad. Some of them involve sitting around talking, some of them. But most of my memories, or at least many of the laugh-generating moments and memories, the life lesson memories, involve activity. They involve doing and and going and exerting and just just going places. Sometimes it was on foot. One time we were climbing through a fence and a and a big snake bit my dad. It was just a black snake, but he stepped on it, so it it bit him. He went to the hospital and everything was fine. Uh, another it, going places. We were, we were in a pickup. Some of my funniest, most awkward memories with my dad were in were in pickup trucks. We had ridden horses all day. And it was a 1959 Ford two-door pickup. And he had ridden horses with me all, all day. We'd probably ridden three or four hours. And, and then, then he was driving along and we were passing the field where the horses were now turning, turned loose. And, and he was gripping the steering wheel like he was trying to choke it to death. And, and he looked straight ahead and he said, <clears throat> uh, You're sorry. I'm sorry, Siri. And, and, and he was choking <laughs> I hate that. And, and, and he, said, the, he, he said out of the blue, it's so random. He said, well, son, do you have any questions? I had no idea the topic. Well, yeah, why, why is, you know, pi r square? Why, I don't understand. That. Why does the earth spin this direction? I had no idea. But it was time for the talk. It happened in a pickup truck. We were going places. So look at me with 1 Kings 19 and then 2 Kings chapter 2, and we'll focus on this subject of going places with our Heavenly Father. Chapter 19, verse 19, 1 Kings. So Elijah went and found Elisha. Elijah's the old prophet. Elisha becomes his protege. Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, and Elisha was plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. In other words, he started going places with this man named Elijah. Chapter 2 of 2 Kings 2 Kings 2, 1, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. That means the place of turning or the place of renewal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Then part of verse 4, the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. Elisha replied again, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on to Jericho. Then jumping to part of verse 6, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. For the Lord told me to go, told me to go, told me to go. He was always going places to go to the Jordan River. And again, Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Fifty men, verse 7, from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance. So now they're walking toward the Jordan River and 50 guys, school of the prophet, they're kind of prophets in training some way or the other. They're at a distance, this group of prophets, they went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. Well, the river divided and the two of them went across, they're going places, on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share, a double portion of your spirit. 
You have asked a difficult thing, verse 10. Elijah replied, if you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request, but if not, then you won't. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, now, before I read on, I know this God that can do cool stuff like that. I, I know him. I don't just know about him. I know him. And he can do this cool stuff when it suits his purposes. You can cling to a puny, anemic, controllable God that seems more human than divine if you want to, but I choose the God of the Bible who can do what needs to be done in the moment it needs to be done. He's dependable, and he's capable, and he will never be shorter than his word. Always lives up to his word. And Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight... Elisha tore his clothes in distress, showing his distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he, had, uh, when he was taken up. Then Elijah, Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. Oh, it's one of my favorite Bible stories. I just, I just love this story. So going places in this story means literally Elijah and Elisha going places together. But for the purposes of this teaching, understand that we're referencing or pointing to going places, you and I going places with the Heavenly Father of the Bible. So stay with me in my slightly mixed metaphor. You good? All right. If you're not, I'm still preaching. So number one, from Elijah and Elisha, I learn, going places with the Father involves changing our life focus. In chapter 19, the old guy comes up, walks through the field, he passes 11 others, and he throws this cloak over this young man's shoulder. The young man gets it immediately. This is, this is not just a, a, a runway rehearsal for me to try on a new garment. This old guy who Elisha would have been familiar, his family would have been familiar. This prophet was a powerful, recognized man in the kingdom. And he knew that this guy was saying, there's something more for you than this particular career path. Now, Elisha had a good life. He was the hard-working boss of a big operation. When you hear he was plowing with the 12th set, so there's 24 oxen in the field, 12 men holding on to the wooden handles of the plow, doing extremely hard labor to get a field plowed, but they had some money. They had some wherewithal as a family. It was a big family farm, and Imagine a huge tractor with several plows hooked up as part of the equipment. It's a, it's a big operation. And his dad's not out in the field. In other words, he's trusting his boy Elisha to run the operation. So this is a, a good life. It's a life of predictability. It's a life of repetition, cyclical with the seasons. And it's a, a life with some fairly pretty much unchanging scenery. Uh, seeing the backside of an ox and dodging what comes out of it was kind of his his day-to-day. -day, uh, some of you will get that later. <laughs> now, that kind of life is worthy. It's a good career choice. There's nothing wrong with that career choice. There's nothing wrong with Elisha staying in the in the family business. But God sometimes has a plan for individual lives that don't allow us, if we follow his plan, it doesn't allow us to stay involved in our career choice. In other words, he sometimes says, you've been focused on this, it's time to focus on something else. So after this moment, he realizes that uh, God's asking me to give this up to have that. 
Now, let me say to you moms and dads in this room, I don't know what your um, uh, opinion is about preachers. I don't know what your opinion is about, uh, about pastors. I don't know what your opinion is about your children or yourself ever following Jesus into ministry leadership. But I want you to hear this. I'm urging you, moms and dads, to be like Shaphat. That was the name of Elisha's daddy. We don't know his mom's name, but she was a part of his life because he wanted to kiss her as well as his dad and say goodbye. They didn't say to Elisha, son, don't you understand? You will never make much money as a preacher. They said, instead, go with a man of God. I was 11 years and 11 months old, laying on my back in a prayer posture at a youth camp. And Jesus spoke to me. Now you can say, wow, if he thinks God's talking to him, maybe he, he needs some Ritalin or maybe a little Valium or maybe both. Um, God spoke to me. I was almost 12 years old and Jesus said to me, Terry, will you preach my gospel? When I got home from that camp and told my mom and dad, they said, well, son, if Jesus spoke that to you, that's wonderful. Just obey him. They didn't bring it up anymore. With my mama, she has dementia now and lives in a nursing home in Arkansas. And, and uh, uh, one day, Karen and I were driving us along in Arkansas and showing mom the old home places. And, and with dementia, mom sometimes gets on what we call the hamster wheel. And she, she gets to go and tells the same thing over and over. It's, it's, it's like a recording. And when it ends, you rewind and press play. And it, it's, she got on a hamster wheel and she said, you know, son, when you were a little boy, your daddy and I always saw the hand of God on your life. We knew you were called to ministry. But we didn't want to say anything because we wanted you Jesus called, not mama called. She took a breath or two, looked out the window, and then she said, you know, son. And that went on for about an hour. Because she said, we wanted you to know that you were Jesus called, not mama called. Now, he may not call you to leave your current Career. He may ask you to simply be a great witness and a great presence of the living God where you live in the military or where you run your business or whatever your job may be. But I promise you, if you've encountered the Heavenly Father, if you intend to go places with Him, your life focus will shift from just being a good employee to being a person who reflects the presence and love of God wherever you go. Whether you're walking behind oxen or you're declaring a prophetic word. But parents, I urge you, be like Shaphat and his wife who said to their son, if Jesus is calling you, we're all for you. You. We will never say you'll never have a retirement if you go into ministry. We're going to say Jesus has always provided for us, son, baby girl. He's always provided for us, and he will always provide for you. And you will have your own stories of the provision of God, just like Dad and I have. So whatever Jesus asks of your life will require a focus on going where he leads. Secondly, from Elijah to Elisha, from Elijah and Elisha, I learned going places with the Father positions us to learn and gain character in the shadows. From the moment he's described receiving the call of God in chapter 19, he doesn't show up again until verse 1 of chapter 2. But if we will allow ourselves, if you are hoping to be a leader in anything, I urge you, be ready to live for a while in obscurity. Don't chase the spotlight too soon. Because in the obscure place, like Elisha, he watched his master, his father spiritually. He watched him interact with leadership in wartime and in peacetime. He watched him confront kings that were corrupt and evil queens. He watched him as 50 soldiers came up to a hill where he was sitting and they said, the king demands that you come down. And he watched how he interacted with the supernatural and with the natural and he learned, watch your leaders emulate their lives. I promise you, if you don't know how to get to heaven, 
Watch Pastor Troy and Pastor Lacey, and they will show you how to get there. No, they're not perfect, but I'm telling you, they know where they're going, and if you want to go where they're going, they're dependable. Keep your eye. Even in the obscure shadows, go places with God. Number three, I need to hurry along. From Elijah and Elisha, I learned going places with the Father creates a warmer perspective about him. In chapter 2, verse 3 and 5, the sons of the prophets, these students in the prophetic schools, they say to Elisha, they say, hey, do you know that your master will be taken from you today? He says, yes, I know that. He, he shows up to the next place and they say, hey, do you know that your master is going to be taken away from you today? He says, yes, I know that. Notice they referenced him as master. But when Elijah, verse 12, is caught away in a whirlwind, would you stop it, Siri? I'm having trouble hearing you. Well, I'm yelling out the top of my lungs. I... <laughs> Siri needs a hearing aid. So, no, you stop. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. They say your master is ta- your master will be taken, but when the whirlwind captures him, he doesn't say, "My master, my master." Listen to the warmth in his voice when he cries out, "My father, my father." The boys in the school treated him in a professional way. He was distant. It was professional but Elisha said my father my father in Romans 8 the Bible says when the spirit of God is working in us that we will start treating God not as a a professional sense but there will be he said in Romans 8 he said you will cry by the spirit Abba Abba which is a pet name daddy it's daddy oh daddy God Abba, this young man, Elisha, said, My father, my father, I urge us today in these moments I have remaining, I urge us to stop seeing him as some kind of man upstairs or or the Chinese philosophical yin and yang or worse yet the Star Wars force. You know, take the force, Luke. You know, trust your feelings. That's the dumbest advice in the world. Trust your feelings. But I digress. Stop seeing him as a cosmic party pooper and see him warmly as the uncreated creator of the universe, as the loving father who is not willing that anyone should spend eternity apart from him unless they want to do so. See him as the caring God who sees people who loves people, who helps us escape from our self-made prison of sin and to live in the freedom that only He has the capacity to provide. Speak to Him warmly as Jesus said to speak to Him, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Our Aren't you glad you can, on this, aren't you glad on this Father's Day we can say Our Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And finally, from Elijah and Elijah. Are you okay? You getting anything? If it's not helping you, it's helping me. So just just hang on while I finish my therapy. (laughs) Elijah and Elisha, I learned, number four, going places with the Father. Places bigger dreams in our souls. I'm not criticizing anybody's dream. Don't, Don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing anybody's dream. But there's something about going places with the Father. That things, instead of just black and white, dull, gray dreams, God God starts saying, you know, I've got better than that. I've got things in bright, vivid color for you. You You can do better than your dad or your grandpa did. You can do better than your mom or your grandma did. And I'm not suggesting a criticism of them. But I'm saying, God, as you go places, as we go places with him, that he wants to stir up dreams that are different than the world's dreams. Elijah says, what do you want, boy? I've tried several times to get you to just take an easier road. Stop walking with me when I finish this route. I'm, I'm headed to heaven in a in, in a little bit, and, and so stay here, but you've not done that. You've, you've said, I'm not about to leave you. I'm sticking with you, mister. And so he says, all right, boy, what do you want? And he says, here's what I want. 
the spirit that is on you, the way you do ministry, the way you do life, I want a double portion of that. And in Deuteronomy, he would have been familiar with Deuteronomy. The law says that a dad, a man who had more than one wife, maybe he loves one more than the other, but from the wife that he doesn't love as much, that he has a child first, a boy first, then that child is the one that when it's time to distribute the inheritance, the oldest boy from the less loved wife still gets the double portion. In other words, he gets the part that says, I become responsible for moving this enterprise forward. The rest of my siblings get something, of course, but I get responsibility for moving this thing forward. And I'm telling you, Elisha is saying, I want to have your power, but I also want to be recognized as someone worthy of following because Father, my daddy in the spirit, gave me a double portion and is saying to everybody else, watch his life, follow his example. I love that he had a dream, that he could live a life that influenced other people to accomplish the work and will of God. Now Elijah says, that's my dream, I want a double portion, I want a double portion. But he knew he couldn't accomplish his dream Unless God showed up. That's why verse 14 says he took the old cloak and wrapped it up. And he stepped up to the bank of the river and said, Where's the, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? The King James it says, Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And he swung the coat, the cloak, and it hit the water. and The water divided. In other words, he says, God, will you show up for me? Oh, dear friends, I don't know what the dream is you have. But if it's a dream that can be accomplished without God showing up, please trade it in for a dream that says, I want my life to count for eternity, not just now. You might have $10 million in your retirement account, but if you aren't dreaming a dream that requires God to show up, you are like penniless spiritually. Dream dreams like Elisha that says, where is God? Oh, God, show up. Show up in my family that's unsaved. Show up in my job where people don't know Jesus. Show up and transform alcoholics. Transform those who are confused sexually. Transform those who are, who are bound up in all. Oh, Jesus, show up because I can't change them. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Going places with God. In 2020, pardon me, in 2012, Hugh Jackman was robbed. He should have received an Oscar for his portrayal of Jean Valjean in Les Mis. And for those of you that disagree, you have every right to be wrong. <laughs> but Anne Hathaway sang a powerful, beautiful song, I Dreamed a Dream. And the last refrain, the refrain said, I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell. I'm living so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. So my urging before I hand this back over to Pastor Lacey, go places with your heavenly father and dream a dream for yourself, for your family, for this world that life will kill unless the Lord, the God of Elijah shows up. Go places with him. He loves you, and he'll show up. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being willing to go places with us. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that anyone who's not following Jesus will today take a next step and say yes to your leadership and your control of their life, that they will confess their sin and say, oh, God, make me new. Bless us on this Father's Day as we serve you and dream your dreams. In Jesus' name. Amen.